Hello and welcome to our Bible study on the book of Ezekiel. Today we're looking at chapter 14. I'm Pastor Mike Grobelch and I'll be leading this Bible study on the prophet Ezekiel. I'm one of the pastors at Peace Lutheran Church in Pico Rivera and the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in North Long Beach. If you would like to receive a copy of a study outline prior to our study online, please contact us by email at P-E-A-C-E-L-U-T-H-C-H -E at gmail.com. Or you may send a DM to either of our two Facebook pages. Please remember to include your email address too, so we may email the materials to you. Before we start, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly and Gracious Father, as we come before you to study the book of Ezekiel, we ask that you open our hearts and our minds to the lessons that we can apply in our daily lives today. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. And we see here that the elders of Israel have come to the prophet Ezekiel, the prophet being in white, to talk about or to inquire about certain things that are going on. Um, now, we believe that, and we'll get into the study in this, that these elders um, are theological in nature. They're not just governmental leaders. And let's begin with uh, reading the first nine verses. We'll talk a little bit about it, and then we'll go through the rest of it. Starting in verse one, then some elders of Israel came to me and sat down before me. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, these men have set their idols in their hearts and have put right before their faces the stumbling block of their iniquity. Should I be consulted by them at all? Therefore speak to them and tell them, thus says the Lord God, any man of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart puts right before his face the stumbling block of his iniquity and then comes to the prophet. I, the Lord, will be brought to give him an answer in the matter in view of the multitude of his idols, in order to lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel, who are estranged from me through all their idols. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent and turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all your abominations. For anyone of the house of Israel or of the immigrants who stay in Israel, who separates him, himself from me, sets up his idols in his heart, puts right before his face the stumbling block of his iniquity, and then comes to the prophet to inquire of me for himself, I, the Lord, will be brought to answer to him in my own person. I will set my face against the man and make him a sign and a proverb. I will cut him off from among my people, so you will know that I am the Lord. But if the prophet is prevailed upon to speak a word, it is I, the Lord, who have prevailed upon that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people, Israel. Okay. I apologize for that technical glitch that we had here. So we have the, Isra uh, the elders of Israel coming to Ezekiel, and they still harbor and are worshiping their idols, and God calls them out on this. They, you know, they said they, their, their idols are in their hearts, and they have put basically in front of them this stumbling block, and in, God is asking why should they come to inquire of me? Why should they come and ask the real living God what uh, these idols, what they believe these idols are saying? And he says, you know, I will, I will be brought to anger on, on this because the house of Israel, and when we say house of Israel, we're talking about all of Israel, are estranged from me through their idols. Okay, God is saying, 
you basically are all idol worshipers. And that carries forward to today. We all have our idols that we many times place in front of God. It could be money or wealth. It could be power. It could be intellect. It could be um, children. I, I have seen a lot of people in Southern California, they will do anything for their children because they live vicariously through them. Um, we see, you know, children who are pushed and, and given lots of advantages for, say, music. And when the child becomes quite good, the parents say, look what I have done. Look what my child has done. Not recognizing that this God-given talent has been developed, but it is, in the essence, God's talent that he granted that child. Um, and now he's, he's saying that, you know, I'm going to speak against them. Now, in verse 5, we say the whole house of Israel. And I want to make uh, something very clear. The vast majority of people were worshiping idols of one sort or another. There were a remnant of people that never uh, got involved in this idol worship. So in this case, God is talking to those who are, are the idol worshipers, not to the sacred few. And if you remember a couple of chapters ago, when uh, Ezekiel is having one of his visions, the angel has the mark, the tov mark, marked on their forehead to, so that those people are spared uh, God's judgment because they have been held right in God's eyes. And, you know, repent, you know, God gives them the choice. Here's the gospel. Repent and turn away from your idols. You know, this is God giving you them one more chance. And he said, but if anyone in the house of Israel or the immigrants separates himself from me, and that's important because this separation comes from man. It's not God separating them. It is man separating himself from God. Then I, the Lord, I, Yahweh, will be brought to answer to him in my own person. And this is something that will occur for everybody at the time of their death. They will be judged. They will stand in front of the throne of God and be judged on their actions. The Christian, the believer, is judged on the righteousness of Christ. The non-believer is judged on his actions or her actions, and their actions don't measure up to God's standard. And so, as they said, as, as the prophet says here, those people have separated themselves from God. They have consciously walked away from him. And now they're going to reap their reward. And that reward is total and complete separation for God for all eternity. Um, we call that hell. The believer being cloaked in the righteousness of Christ is welcomed into heaven to be with God for all eternity. But God is saying here that he will himself judge these people. And that's a good warning and cautionary tale for you and I. Yes, I am a pastor. Yes, sometimes I need to call people out on their sin. But it is not our responsibility to judge people. That's God's role. Ours is to tell them what the Word of God says and to love them so they understand that God does, in fact, love them. 
and God desires them to be with him for all eternity, but some people make a different choice. And in the last year, we see that the Lord is going to, um, you know, a prophet who goes along with the crowd, with the majority, with the people who want something, God is going to stretch out his hand against him and destroy him from all his people, all of Israel, and by extension, all of Christendom, because we are the new chosen people in Christ. So let's continue. They will bear the punishment of their iniquity, speaking of the prophets, as the iniquity of the inquirer is, so the iniquity of the prophet will be in order that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me and no longer defile themselves with all their transgressions. Thus they will be my people, and I shall be their God, declares the Lord. Pure and simple gospel. Once the, the evil has been removed, God will then be their God, they will be their people in coming back into that relationship that God so desires. Son of man, if a country sins against me by committing unfaithfulness, and I stretch out my hand against it, I destroy its supply of bread, sent famine against it, and cut it off from both man and beast, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in its midst, by their own righteousness, they could only deliver themselves, declares the Lord. Now here God is talking about three individuals of the Old Testament. Job, we know about having lost his family, his cattle, his possessions, every, his home, everything. And he never blamed God. His friends say, you know, what have you done to irritate, to anger God? <clears throat> And Job answers in one of the you know, famous quotes of the Bible, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Daniel had utter and complete faith in God. Even to the point where he told the king that he would not worship the, uh, worship the king, that he would worship Yahweh. Daniel and his partners were thrown in the oven and God closed the lion's jaws so they couldn't, um, or I'm sorry, they threw uh, Daniel in the lion's den, and they couldn't, um, the lions could not devour him. Noah took what God told him and built an ark, even though I'm sure people were going by going, hey, look at this guy, he's building a boat, and it, it there's no reason for him to do it, but he listened to God. He did what he said, and, you know, their acts of, of believing in God were counted to them as righteousness. But they don't have enough righteousness to cover anybody else. There's only one man that ever has been able to cover other people's sin, and that is God in the flesh in the form of Jesus Christ. Now, he goes on. If I were to cause the wild beasts to pass through the land and they depopulated it, and it became so desolate that no one would pass through it because of the beast, those these three men were in its midst, as I live, declares the Lord God, they could not deliver either their sons or their daughters, let alone would be delivered, but the country would be desolate. Or if I should bring a sword on the country and say, let the sword pass through the country and cut off man and beast from it, even though these three men were in its midst, as I live, declares the Lord, they could not deliver either their sons or their daughters, but they alone would be delivered. Or if I sent a plague against the country and pour out my wrath and blood on it to cut off man and beast from it, Even though Noah and Daniel and Job were in its midst, as I live, declares the Lord, 
they could not deliver either their son or their daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. Thus says the Lord God, how much more will I send my four severe judgments against Jerusalem? Sword, famine, wild beast, and plagues to cut off man and beast from it. Yet behold, survivors will be left in it who will be brought out, both sons and daughters. Behold, they are going to come forth to you, and you will see their conduct and actions, and you will be comforted for the calamity which they have brought against Jerusalem for everything which I have brought against it. Then they will comfort you and you will see their conduct and actions for you will know that I have not done in vain or whatever I did to do it declares the Lord God. There is a tremendous amount of the law in this. Um, and I want to go back a slide or two. And first of all, talking about eating of blood. In Leviticus 17, uh, verse 11, it's re you read the following. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you uh, on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of its life that makes atonement. Any person who eats any blood, even, the person, even that person shall be cut off from his people. This is an extremely serious thing. This person is exiled, uh, excommunicated in, in modern words. Now, in Matthew 26, we read the following. And when he, Jesus, had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Meaning that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice that pays for all people's sins for all times. Now, I know some of you might be thinking at this time, what about the people of the Old Testament? What about the people who lived before Christ? And that's, it's, that's a, it's a legitimate and a good question. The answer to that is their faith is accounted to them as righteousness. In the passage we've been reading today, uh, Noah, Job, and uh, Daniel were all accounted for as being righteous because of their faith in God. We, post-incarnation, post, -incarnation, post uh, the birth and uh, atoning sacrifice of Jesus, we're covered by the blood of Christ. His blood is the atoning sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, the last sacrifice, that atones for all sins. So we are covered. Now the uh, Levitical law that we see here on the, on the screen, that was, um, God lifted that. God did not make that, um, no longer did we as believers have to follow that. The uh, ceremonial law had served its purpose and now was no longer required because God instituted a new covenant, and that is what we call Holy Communion. Communion, excuse me. Now, I would like to go back to um, verses 10 to 19, and I want to talk a little bit about this. Um, God is making a point here that even though he sends all these plagues and famine and war, Noah, Daniel, and Job, if they were living in the midst of Jerusalem, their actions could only save themselves. They could not save their closest relatives, their sons and daughters, or anybody else. Just them. They couldn't even, you know, their closest, you know, relatives, their sons or daughters, they would be delivered um, for judgment because their actions weren't enough. We in, uh, in the Christian church know that Jesus died for our sins. We are united with, uh, with Jesus in his death through our baptism. You know, it is the word of God. 
Jesus is the Word of God that cleanses us when we are baptized. Now, people often get this confused. Once I'm baptized means I will never sin again, and, and that's not the case. You will sin. Um, you can't stop it. <clears throat> it is your very nature. But even though you sin, you are forgiven through the grace of God by faith that the Holy Spirit has worked in you since that time you were baptized. <coughs> Excuse me. And that word continues to work in you through the Holy Spirit throughout your life. If you were baptized as an infant, the Word of God is working in you continuously to the time of your death. If you are an adult, you, know, you receive baptism as an adult, Holy Spirit still works from that time to the time of your death to flame or to inflame your faith, to increase your faith. And the more that you trust in God, the more that you find it easier to do it. And I don't want to trivialize that. That's not an easy process. It's a process where uh, we as believers continually must throw ourselves at the mercy of God. We must because without God's mercy and grace, we're in, uh, we're doomed. We are doomed to spend all eternity in hell. But even though God is speaking judgment, and there is a lot of judgment being spoken in chapter 14, God still says, he still maintains that survivors will be brought out that people who did not bow or get involved in the cult worship, in the idol worship, they will be saved. And this is also, this has a dual meaning because those believers who die in the faith will indeed be taken, you know, will spend all eternity in heaven. <clears throat> those who reject it, not that God rejected them, that they rejected God, they get exactly what they wanted. Total and complete separation from God. God not in any aspect of their life. And that is our definition of hell. Um, you know, it's something that, you know, people, you know, casually say, go to hell. And that shouldn't be done something casually because it is... Um, it is something that you really don't wish on anyone and shouldn't wish on anyone. Um, there is a movie, uh, the original Planet of the Apes with Charlton Heston. At the very end of the movie, he is riding on the beach and he comes to the um, top head of the Statue of Liberty. And he finally realizes that this planet of the apes is actually Earth that had been, um, that had, had some sort of nuclear conflict in the past, and mankind had been, um, had been brought low, had, you know, sort of regressed in civilization while the apes. Be, you know, became the ascendant and they learned to speak and uh, if you've seen the movie it's a, but his curse at the very end on all the people that were involved in that nuclear, um, nuclear war is probably one of the most profound curses in all of uh, cinema you know because it is you know he is wanting God to damn them for what they had done, for doing, uh, inflicting this massive, um, massive casualties, massive um, overthrow of the created order. And 
Um, I, I do advise you to, to uh, look at the or to watch the movie, if nothing else, for the last oh ten minutes or so. Anyway, we see that God still holds out that hope that still that that remnant will be there for them. And people have asked, and I will continue to reiterate, yes, we do have in-person Bible studies and uh, services. At Peace Lutheran Church, we worship at 9 and 11 on Sunday mornings. Our 11 a.m. service is in Spanish. Our Bible study hour is 10.15 to 11.15. We're located at 9412 Shade Lane in Pico Rivera, California. For those who uh, may not have, may have other things going on, may not be an early riser, St. John's Lutheran Church might be for you. Our worship time is at 12.30 p.m. We have ASL signing available. Our Bible study is 1.30 to 2.30, and we're located at 6698 Orange Avenue in Long Beach. I hope to see you at one of our worship services and Bible studies in the very near future. Until that time, may God bless your study. Thank you for joining us today.